All right, friends. David started us out in Exodus 40. And uh, David, let's, let's go right to what you did toward the end there when you took us to the Garden of Eden. So we see the presence of God there in those last few verses and then the Garden of Eden. So do we understand when we're preaching this that this is a picture of God's reversing the curse? Certainly it's, it's the unfolding of that promise. I do think that the book of Exodus is more um, part two of Genesis than it is a separate work from. So, and I actually think when you get to Leviticus 16 then, you're really now in the centerpiece of how that curse is reversed. Um, so yeah, it's, it's definitely, you're well on the way. But I think for Moses, this, that became his office. Uh, his entire work revolved around the tent of meeting, the proclamation of the word from it, and the substitutionary atonement that Aaron was providing at that time. So the deepest point is the expulsion in Genesis 3. And even there in the garden, you begin to see the coming out of that. And then Exodus is more of that with 12 and the Passover lamb, yeah. the Exodus itself, the law, then as you argue, the, the, the desk, the architect's desk. I love that image. And then the, the, picture that's going to, uh, the picture that's going to set all this up. And then Moses actually doing it all. So everything in the Bible, when we're preaching the Bible, everything after the expulsion from the garden is moving toward the re-presencing of God with his people. Yeah, without a doubt. And, and I think you have to ask yourself then, what, what was Moses cognizant of? I mean, that's why I, I tried to utilize Moses to look back to Genesis and the rest of the Bible to get to Christ. But I think Moses knew he was part of this reclamation renewed sense where God dwells in the presence of his people. You, you also made the provocative comment, and guys, anybody can jump in here. I'm, I'm going to just keep doing this by nature, but anybody can jump in. So you made the provocative comment that the, the, this day was more significant, this work of the tabernacle building, than the mountain and the law. I think for the general evangelical preacher, when we think about, hey, I'm going to go preach something from the Pentateuch, we often think about the thunderings of Mount Sinai. Yeah. And that's what you're saying is not the loudest note in Exodus. Well, so if you divide Exodus into three kind of movements, how God saves his people through Passover, the main event, and he gets them to the mountain. And once there, he defines what worship is. He speaks to his people. And that speech goes on from Exodus 20 all the way to 31 something. But even the speech of God on the mountain, half of it is about the tabernacle. So even when you're at the speech, God wants to communicate how he's going to return to the midst of his people. And then you move from, from him saving them, him speaking to them about that, to Moses then actually doing this work where God settles among his people. So David, if I can think of old churches in Europe that had the Ten Commandments up on the wall. Yeah, sure. Sure. Is that a bad idea? <laughs> no, no. So they have the Ten Commandments at every Anglican church I've ever been in, and they have the Apostles' Creed, and they often have the Lord's Prayer. And when people catechize God's people back in the day, you read all, they were all catechizing out of that material. So That's how Calvin started the first yeah. his first editions, those three things. Yeah, so, so I don't want to convey through that line that somehow the law is, you know, second-tier stuff. Um, I was provocatively trying to convey we often miss what I think is the dominant theme of the book. Yeah, which I'm, is pr the, I'm provoked. Which, yeah. Okay, so, um, <laughs> so just to be clear, brother, if, if, if I ask these brothers if they've ever preached from the Pentateuch, so if you've ever preached from the Pentateuch, please stand. Now, stay standing if you preached on all of or one of the Ten Commandments. A lot of people have preached on the Ten Commandments. <laughs> Stay standing if you've preached on the tabernacle specifically. Not just been in a sermon, but you've had at least one sermon on the tabernacle or a passage about the tabernacle. 
Yeah, see, right. so there's a little less emphasis on the tabernacle. Okay, thanks. You can be seated. Brothers, but, anybody else want to hop in here? So I'm preaching through the Gospel of Mark, and pretty soon I'm going to get to the two great commandments, to love God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, and to love your neighbor as yourself. And the first sermon I'm going to preach, I'm going to preach five sermons on it. The first is an introduction in which I'm going to line up the two great commandments with every stage of our salvation. How the two great commandments line up with an unconverted person and bring them to the cross. And what the, what the person in conversion finds at the cross related to the two great commandments, namely the price of their disobedience paid and the perfection of the righteousness that Jesus earned for us in that he did fulfill the two great commandments every moment of his life imputed, given to us positionally. Next, sanctification. The two great commandments and the indwelling Holy Spirit and the Spirit's consistent leadership to the justified but not yet glorified Christian to fulfill the two great commandments every single day, day after day after day. Love God, love others, day after day. And then convicting when we don't. And then thirdly, at glorification, those two great commandments perfected in us for all eternity so that we supersede law in every respect. We don't need to be commanded because we just will love God and love others perfectly and what those dimensions will look like in eternity. That's one sermon. Um, so it's just, it's not, it's not that simple um, to say the law kills, etc. It's, it's just too simplistic. If you look at the two great commandments as a summation of the law, we would never say, hey, we don't need to love God or love others anymore. Now that we've come to, you know, free from the law, happy condition, that kind of thing, it's a little bit limited. Um, so that's the, the introductory sermon I'm going to preach. Would you have preached that passage differently? I don't think I would have studied it well enough to have been able to preach it like David did. So, David, I, I think it was superb. I think everything you observed was there, and you helped me see it. And I, like, underlined stuff in my Bible. So thank you. I don't know. Yeah. Yeah, I was going to say, I think one of the things that was evident is that you spent a lot of time in that text. And I think um, oftentimes preachers can say, hey, this is a really important text. This is foundational. You should feel moved by this text. That has its own kind of benefit and utility. But it's a different thing when you see the preacher himself is moved by it. And you made a statement of like, if I could be anywhere in Moses' day, I'd be on that front seat splattered with the blood. You can tell that the text gripped you and that you're bringing out these big things that maybe we haven't seen. But I love also you're trying to help us with self-discovery. So you're telling us, look at these things. right? You can see clearly what God said to do and then what Moses did. Or look clearly for yourself. I'm, I'm not just getting these things for myself, look at these seven statements that the writer wants you to see that Moses did what the Lord commanded. So just that kind of passion that the text has created in you and then wanting us to get it, not just by telling us to, to, to get it, but look at the text, feel what the text is doing. Yeah, that's a great model. Omar, that's what I thought was one of the strengths of what he said at first when he summarized, you know, what the duty we have as ministers is. It's preaching of Christ and your pursuit of holiness he didn't say preaching of Christ and your pursuit of holiness is what you do. He said preaching of Christ and your pursuit of holiness from the scriptures is what you do. And that was his little signature, I think, of guys, get your nose in the Bible. A uh, couple of things. So in Texas, we have what we call the greatest barbecue on the planet. Uh, <laughs> because the brisket's so good. And good briskets are like, it just takes, it's like low and slow. You can't rush it. And it can be intimidating to do that kind of thing. Uh, Exodus 40 is like a big old fat brisket. It's just like, how am I going to, how am I going to preach this thing? Uh, at 35 years old, would you have preached that in that similar way? And would you have had the same comfort you had today preaching that passage? I, I would say no, right? I mean, we're always growing. I think what I'm learning when you're preaching longer texts is to see the organization which then will bring simplicity for the listener. So I actually felt at a literary level, there's a lot of ways to walk through that text. You could do it verse by verse. But when I actually saw that there are two discourse pieces, both framed on the first day, then I think that's a way to help the listener. And, and what's, what's happening here? Well, two things are happening here. And in the second one, I didn't do anything other than one thing is being emphasized here. Um, so that simplicity can come. I couldn't have done, you know, that hopefully you get better at that as you keep going, right? 
But apprehending that literary, those literary hangers in big units, I find to be really important for me if I'm going to get simple. Yeah, when you, when I heard it was this passage, I was like, how in the world is he going to preach that passage? And I left like, oh, I want to preach this passage. And I feel like I better understand the structure. I'm like, oh, wow, yeah. that was really amazing. And a couple things I want to highlight you hold, did. Hold on just a sec. So when you say, I, I can't wait to preach that passage, you say saying like HB because sometimes I'll preach something and, and someone will go, man, that was good. And then you hear HB talking to someone else. He goes, yeah, well, you wait till I do that one. <laughs> 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 we, we would never say that, but that is how we all feel, brother. Uh, you did such a good job leaving these like gospel breadcrumbs throughout the passage. I think sometimes as a preacher, you're like, I got to put the gospel in here somewhere, and you just kind of let it go throughout the whole sermon. I was like waiting for you to give me the gospel, and with John 17, it was just so beautifully tied in together there. Well, I think it was a wonderful model of how to preach Christ from all of Scripture. Yeah. Like, maybe this might not be the question in your mind, but effectively, where does this text stand in relation to Jesus? And you're not having to try to fit him in anywhere. You're, you're giving us Moses, the ministry of Moses, the purposes for which the law was given, all finding their culmination and fulfillment in Christ for us to restore us to God's presence. Well, observing the start to be marked as the that was beautiful. I mean, that's just that observation and building out from there. Yeah. And uh, I think. Yeah, I, I was very encouraged by it. And even, I don't, I don't think you do any dishonor to Moses at all in saying when God came down, Moses couldn't go in. He would have been the first to acknowledge it and that the ministry of Christ is far greater. And everything that the law demands of us, Christ has, has provided for us. And the law is good and holy and just, and it could never save. It does guide our living. I thought it was, you honored the law and you heralded Christ. I think it's a good model for us all. Changing lanes just a little bit. Um, so I'm guessing you've preached this in your church congregation before. I have. To them. Was this part of a series in Exodus? I spent three summers in Exodus because it's such a big book. So I did one summer, How Does God Save? That took me up through 18. The second summer, What Does God Have to Say? That took me to the Golden Calf. And then the third summer, How Does God Settle in Our Midst? So that, it would have been in a third summer. Yeah. So I'm, I'm just like, you're, you're really had two points of application. Be faithful in word work, set yourself apart for holiness. You applied it in that way because you had a pastor's conference. So I'm just kind of wondering, like, what did the application look like to your congregation? And was it still as narrow and, and poignant or, or was there more application sprinkled throughout? Like, yeah, how did you apply it to the congregation when you were preaching it to them? Yeah. So before coming here, I looked at the notes that I had preached to the congregation, and it's an entirely different sermon. Um, because I do think the audi your audience, your listeners, I mean, that, that sermon today really should only matter to the people who are here today. That's, that's my conviction. The only people that matter are the ones in front of you. And it's not for a tape, it's not for a recording, it's not anything else. So the, this is a group of people that are in full-time ministry, pursuing ministry, or in leadership within local churches for ministry. So that was the governing principle. Um, so I did, it, I did it differently to my congregation, but um, it was also the final sermon in their ability to have gone through the whole book. So I, I brought some of that in as well. Um, it's beautiful highlighting of everything the Lord did, you know, Moses, uh, the Lord commanded Moses did, yeah. and the seven times as the Lord commanded, so Moses did. Just good observation, brother. Thank you for pulling that out. How would you, uh, so when you're normally preaching like Exodus 40, would you explicitly share the gospel and say this points ultimately to Christ? It's so like there, you had this one line about when God came down, Moses couldn't go in, which with Christ, it's the opposite. When Christ came down, we, we could now go in to God. Would yeah. that be a time in which you might go to the next step of kind of God, man, Christ response? A absolutely. But not this morning with this audience. Sure. Um, in fact, it would be irresponsible to not do that in your regular preaching. But for this audience, it wasn't really a question to me of um, God came down, you can come in through Christ. It's God came down, your role is to lift him up so that others might. Um, yeah. So it, your, your listeners are the only ones that matter. And 
I didn't see a lot of non-Christians here. And if you are a non-Christian, I'd be glad to lead you to Christ from that text over lunch. <laughs> Amen. Any other comments, questions? Andy? Yeah, one thing that struck me a number of years ago, um, I hadn't noticed before, but in Exodus 3, the first thing that God says to Moses is, do not come any closer. And that's an interpretive key for me to the whole book of Exodus because there's a barrier put around Mount Sinai saying if you don't put that barrier, people are going to come up and I'll have to kill them. And then the last word in Exodus is Moses couldn't get in. Um, and as I've been doing scripture memorization in Ezekiel, um, you know, there's this visionary temple that's so confusing and hermeneutically challenging, but fundamentally it's about walls. And it's about God coming down and saying, this is my dwelling place, my glory place, but you can't come in. And there's all these rules and regs about the prince and what he can do and the people and what they can do, but the whole, it's the same message. You can't come in. It's a rebuke. So God isn't dwelling among his people in that sense because he's saying, I'm here, but you cannot come. So this far you may come and no farther sums up the old covenant for me to some degree. Yeah, and, it, and actually it raises the tension, right? Back to Mark's first question on what do you do after Genesis 3? What you real, really realize is, okay, we got a problem. God has promised through one family to solve this problem, Genesis. That promise is moving. You're expecting, now he says, I want you to go build this so I can dwell with you. And you can't. So all of a sudden, at a story level, it's a heightened sense of human dilemma by the end of Exodus. Justin, were you say something? I, I think just even picking up on Andy's observation, some of the things David said today, I, I don't think it's insignificant that Moses, who is representative of the law, is not the one who's able to lead the people into the promised land. It's the same thing. I'm mindful of Charles Spurgeon. Speaking of Sinai and the law, it says anyone who thinks that he can ascend his way to God up the side of Mount Sinai makes it plain that he has never seen that trembling mountain at all. You know? And I just thought today's exposition was a wonderful depiction of all of that, and I'm, I'm thankful to have heard it. David, I noticed you also, with uh, preacherly prescience, looked ahead and specifically mentioned David and his role, and Daniel and his role, and Nehemiah in his role, previewing the rest of the day for us. You just threw that in there off the top of your head because you knew what we were doing. Yeah, well, <laughs> I, I didn't preach anybody else's text, but I think the Lord is orchestrating our selections in ways that I just want to heighten people's anticipation of how this whole two days is going to be more exciting as it goes on. So friends, we coordinated who would do what genre, but we left it up to them to pick the text in that genre. And they didn't necessarily know what each other was going to preach uh, when, they, when they picked it. So, you know, uh, Lord willing, we've got Psalm 4 coming up after lunch. And I think you'll see how Psalm 4 is a, a balm and a consolation and yet a challenge to the preacher as well that will, will fit with this high calling that we've heard from uh, the Lord through Moses. Anything else on Exodus 40, as we've heard David treat it, particularly thinking about expositing scripture as expositional messages? What a privilege. I mean, that's the day in Moses' life I would have wanted to see. But what we get to do every week is actually better. <laughs> so there were 38 verses. And you didn't cover all of them. No. What kind of counsel would you give to young preachers or aspiring preachers about what do you have to cover in a passage like this? Like what's required? Let me just point out, he, he clearly read all of them and knew all of them because he pointed out the seven and the seven. He pointed out the key verse 16, where that's the transition, the two speeches, the section at the end. So while he didn't expound parts of every one of them, he kind of laid the entirety out uh, yeah. So there are different views, right, on what is biblical exposition, and um, everybody's trying to make a unique contribution, as we should all. I do think some people feel that biblical exposition means line by line, word by word, um, and you kind of move through it. And I've been greatly helped by that preaching. 
There's also people that go, no, you don't do line by line. You just get the main, the main idea. If you get the main idea, or if you get any main idea that's true, then you center in on that because you decided to. I'm convinced that biblical exposition is allowing the shape, the organizational shape, or the, the topographical terrain of your text to determine for you the emphasis of the message. So in a narrative, I don't, I don't have to preach line by line, nor even you know, logical thought by thought to feel that like I've comprehensively preached that passage. I don't have to tell you everything about the bread of presence. Mm-hmm. You do all of those things in a run and be done. Well, brother, you gave us the whole book of Leviticus. <laughs> yeah. We're going to need more, more blood. blood. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Wow. <laughs> Praise the Lord. David, can you do that with like a lot of biblical books? Um, I learned a, a lot. There's this guy that put out two volumes, one sermon on every book of the Bible. Yeah, but brother, there's a difference between like an hour long sermon on a book and a, a line, which really just captures the thing. Yeah, well, Leviticus, we need more blood. Numbers, even so, you'll still wander. Deuteronomy, let's give it a second run. <laughs> <laughs> We should maybe at one of these panels just have David go through all 66 books and see what happens. Brothers.